Can I complicate that a bit, though? Please. Um, in the case of France and Italy, in specific, um, uh, the the founders of the of the national syndicalist and the and the and the early fascist movement were almost to a person former Marxist or former anarchist. Um, that's true for Robert Michel. That's true for Mussolini, actually. And what what is interesting about them, and I think what makes their positionism different than just blood and soil nationalism, is that they thought that the romantic nationalism of the prior period was not sufficient enough. Um, that and that they didn't really believe it in the same way. Like uh, Sorel thought all this was a myth to automate people, not that it was there was anything true about it. And he was in, he did not. Sorel himself never abandoned the left, even though he was totally willing to perpetrate anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. He didn't even really believe um, to try to animate people against banking into socialist positions, and he was willing to do that, you know, well into the 20th century. Um, so I think you're completely right. There's this organic conservatism, um, but there is a, there is a shift with their positionism because what, what they call the organic conservatism is the baseline. Then there is the first ideology, the first position, which is liberalism. And then there is the second ideology, which is socialism communism, et cetera. And then the third position is a synthesis of the baseline with the second ideology creating a new thing. Um, and this is explicit in, um, in, in Mussolini. And it leads to a lot of confusion, I think, even in the, the European context, because a lot of the founders of these movements were not we're not just coming out of the left tradition. They were coming out of the left of the left tradition. Mussolini was associated with the, with the left, you know, the proto left communist adjacent flank of the, of the socialist movement in, in Italy. And he embraces this organic conservatism somewhat cynically. Um, but I think what is interesting about this this organicism is it gives there's more ground for them to play with in the us the only equivalent to that is basically neo confederacism and like like southern aristocracy stuff that's it like there's not there's nothing else there's no blood and soil sentiment to cynically use in the same way um i mean groups tried the silver shirts tried i mean ironically like um, the second great instantiation of national Bolshevism is from a guy called uh, Francis Pottsworth Yaki, Yaki, who was an American, who Imperial. was a fascist, yeah, who was a fascist who got obsessed with Stalin. Um, and, you know, but it's... A lot of fascists it is, like Stalin. Yeah, oh yeah, a, a bunch. Um, um, but it's, uh, I, I think the reason why it has been so much more powerful historically in Europe is also like for a lot of these people, I mean, particularly these organic, you know, uh, um, conservatives, like revolutionary conservatives, they would have called themselves, which despite the fact it's kind of a contradiction in terms. Um, I'm from Demestra Ford, you know, right after the French revolution. Um, the, the, the third positionists really were interested in trying to, take elements of this organicism that was already on the right and combine it with um, economic policies they saw from the left because they realized that they could not go back to a medieval economic structure that it was just not viable. Um, so that was the, the, but that's the right end. That's the kind of what the Hitlerist thought. When you look at the Strasserist, um, they seem to come at it. A lot of them really are sincere nationalists, sincere national chauvinist. They really do believe that their race and their, and specifically by their race, they mean their ethnicity. Like they, they don't mean white people in general. They mean Germans. Um, and maybe Aryans as a broader coalition. And that's 
and that gets defined weirdly politically. Um, they thought that you could cynically use this organic conservatism that was more based in Europe, more based in this pre-modern conception that's still around there in a way that's kind of not in the subtle colonial states. Um, and, and glom on to a, a national social, po social policy with it. What they really did sincerely side with the national chauvinist on was a, an absolute rejection of internationalism, at least in, in, in the fascist and Nazi context, that actually gets weirder when it gets to, na to national Bolshevism and it, it, that you get into a, a crazy fever dream in the fifties. But, but yeah, I mean, it, that, this is still not only a thing and it's, it is a real threat in Europe. I mean, I think in a way that people, I think well, in a way that people, the, in the, mm -hmm. I, I think that one, important element is the linguistic difference between European nations. When you have a Hungarian language, a Russian language, um, those linguistic uh, divisions, then ethnicity and the particular tradition of uh, the Russophone or, uh, you know, you name it, uh, Slavic, Germanic uh, peoples, that identity has a lot more salience than simple race. Uh, it also, there's a long history, you know, European history is nothing but one giant um, melee of white on white violence. So yeah. the racial categories that are used in colonial settings um, to delineate um, kind of uh, essentialized status categories make no sense in a uh, European continent, which is wall to wall Caucasian, but has all of these long standing um, practical and identitarian um, ethnic distinctions. And I think that the um, that one of the great aspirations of people like Dugan and the, the whole fourth position, fourth position as concept is to create essentially a fascist international yeah. that um, it doesn't matter that we all have different um, romanticized, mythologized national chauvinisms. The fact that we're all national chauvinists, to use a word, uh, to use a term that um, has popped up in the, in the chat quite correctly, um, unifies us in opposition to the globalists, the cosmopolitans, the liberals, you know, those cucks. And right. um, that, and the failure, the visible um, failure of global neoliberalism to live up to its promises. Um, and the sense of global crisis and social crisis within individual countries that has come from that makes people open to extreme uh, counter systemic um, solutions. And the advantage that these kind of far right ideologies have is that they combine some of the rational program of the left with a mystical appeal to greater powers and a kind of call to adventure that uh, rational enlightenment ideology like Marxism doesn't are you, have. Are you talking about this traditionalism? Yeah, radical traditionalism. Uh, Religion-ish, cultish thing that a lot of these guys are into, yeah. like Dugan and Bannon and what's the cat in Brazil? Uh, Bolsonaro. But his guru, spiritual guru. Oh, um, I'm not sure who the Brazilian is, but the um, it often these types aren't real believers, but they like having a uh, a mission or uh, something to stand for. In in the same way that you know, like Fast and the Furious is just a car movie, except you know when the concept of family gets introduced because mm. that that is the bigger thing that can justify whatever you need to justify. Mm -hmm.